Hi, my name is Robert. And my name is Daryl, and we're the Hauslers. We found Declaration uh, April of 2021, and that's really when our journey catapulted into where we are now in this season. Um, a season through infertility, a season through doubt, through sadness, happiness, sadness again, and now sitting here at 29 weeks pregnant um, with the prospect of having our very first child in October, a boy. That fall semester was the first semester uh, coming out of the gate that we joined Freedom as a couple and we I think we did DNA one, DNA two, and then somebody connected us with the idea of joining a freedom group. And it was the one where it was for couples mm -hmm. with Drew and Julia. I had been wrestling when I was going through freedom about recommitting with baptism. Uh, but that was a season in my life where I was still trying to figure out where I was in my relationship with Christ, that I wasn't really fully committed if doing a declaration in public was in the cards. And uh, since, since that moment, I feel like my faith as n not only internally, but as her spiritual rock has grown exponentially and my hunger to just want more has grown as well. We had a co-ed group and that's when we did our first IVF. Um, we had a heartbeat at six weeks, which is incredible when you hear it because he's like the top, uh, she, it was a girl. Um, she had a heartbeat at six, six weeks and I'm like, that's just crazy. A grain, grain size, barely, I think. A flicker on the spring. flickering. <laughs> So Tuesday, that Tuesday leading up to Freedom Conference, that Saturday, right, is when we picked up a heartbeat for the very first time. 48 hours later, she copious amounts of bleeding, mm. has a miscarriage on our last Freedom group mm. before the Freedom Conference that Saturday. Whether God would have said the next season's gonna be the season that you're gonna get pregnant. Or even if God said, you know what? You guys aren't meant to be biological parents. It, it might be adoption. It might be surrogacy. We were content after that because of everything we've been through. Yeah, after that first miscarriage, I was kind of like, gosh, like I failed again. What did I do? And when I hear the women in that freedom group, because we did like a, a little dinner after right. When, right. We, we, when we met up, I didn't realize that like three of the women there also went through from scared. And I'm like, wow, this is more common than I thought. And it was very humbling that even if you try your best at something and you do your everything, if it's not his will, his time, he's, he's, he has other plans. And I'm sorry, the yes, no, yes is awesome. No can be really hard at that time, but wait, gosh, it's like, so where do I go from here? And it's sometimes so hard to do the waiting. Even if you reach freedom, you get all those, like you get temptations, you get doubt, you get all of that. But at the same time, it's the tools to overcome. It's the tools that you need to those, those, overcome. And then those the giants idea. are never going to yeah. truly just disappear. Yeah. Um, but when that giant shows up, mm. or it might be a smaller giant, yeah. um, you have the tools in the tool belt to address it. And then you just got to focus your your um, attention to Jesus and say, hey,
God, I can't handle this. And I know you've gotten me through it before. And so those lies that you're, you don't deserve it, you're not enough. He just says, I love you. And basically, hey, you're gonna get through it. You might not know what that looks like because he might tell you something completely ridiculous and you're like, oh, okay, that doesn't make sense, but okay. But do not hesitate to pray. We, we, we see praying as just more arrows and stuff that we can use against the enemy. It is, even if you've slayed your giant once, they come back and don't feel like you're failing. Because unfortunately, it's a, a spiritual battle, I yep. think. And the enemy is always around and he will keep reminding you of something because it's so deep rooted. But you just got to remember and focus on God in a sense that your identity is rooted in Jesus. Amen. Man, let's honor the houses, will you? Would you give them a hand for that? Great story, great testimony. Powerful. I hope you heard some of the things that I heard, you know, um, is they were engaging God in a deeper way. Um, they had gone to DNA 1 and 2. Shameless plug, it's coming. So uh, we'd love for you to be a part of DNA um, here in the next, actually next week, I think, right? Is that right? Starts next week. And so um, we'd love for you to do that and go to declaration.org and see all about it. I think it'd be great. And for you um, and your family, but they, they, they had engaged DNA. They were involved in a small group. That's coming too. Um, and they were pressing into freedom. They were part of a freedom group, very powerful. They found themselves under attack. Um, they were in the valley of battle, if you will, surrounded by giants of loss and grief, attacked by probably disillusionment, not to put words in their mouth, but disappointment, um, some doubt, yet faithfully doing all that they could do, right, while hanging on to faith um, in their strength, doing all they could do, trusting God. They chose to believe God for what only God could do. And uh, man, look how God is moving. Amen. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, thank you, Robert and Daryl. I don't know where you are, if you're in this service or the next one, but thank you for that word. Um, I said it last week. I'll say it again. Either you've been in a battle, you'll be in a battle, or you're in a battle right now. Much like we saw with King Saul at all times, we are constantly surrounded by an enemy who not only is on the attack, but is always planning more attacks from every side. Um, now, listen, I say this a lot, and it's probably because it's important, and it's, it's important to remember. The enemy, the devil hates God, and he hates you. You've got to know this. He hates that you are created in God's image. He hates that you have a way through Jesus to salvation and redemption and freedom. He hates that God has called you and forgiven you and adopted you and cleansed you and empowered you. He hates that God has a purpose-filled destiny for your life. Listen, the enemy will do everything he possibly, anything and everything he possibly can to derail you, to divide, to destroy, um, to depress, to discourage. He's going to do everything he can. Everything. This is why we deal with spiritual warfare. This is the why of battles that we face and fight. We have to know because of who we are in Christ um, that we are an adopted child of God. And uh, to be an heir of the king, to be an adopted child, is to know that there are assignments placed upon our life from the enemy. When God appoints and anoints kings, the devil assigns giants. So last week we ended with David, um, the part-time shepherd for his dad, Jesse, and the part-time armor bearer slash kind of music, minister of music, so to say, if you will, to the current king Saul. David, the one who had been anointed to be the future king of God's people due to King Saul's disobedience to God, David, the one who had gone to meet up with the army of Israel, if you remember, if you were here, carrying the supplies to his brothers at the command of his dad, Jesse, it was there we see that after 40 days and 40 nights of the army of Israel doing the same thing, they would get in battle formation, they would hype themselves all up with battle cries, and they'd line up on one mountain against the Philistines on the other with a valley in between. From every, literally every day, the same thing would happen. The giant from Gath, Goliath, um, would come out and I'm sure this dude, if, you know, if he was an Instagram influence, I was thinking about this. His handle would probably be G the Giant. All filtered up, looking powerful and whatnot. 
Not to be confused with his prodigal yet more popular cousin, Jolly Green Giant, who was more about beans than battles. But it's a big old scary giant. Goliath. He would come out every day and every night. He would be adorned with this heavy 125 pound scaly looking, if you will, armor, which was thought to resemble one of his gods named Dagon. And here he is carrying his heavy, mean and menacing looking weapon of warfare, breathing death threats, shouting the same insults to the people of God. We see in 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 8. Also, he's insulting God himself. And rather than causing a sense of rage for retribution to rise up within the ranks of the Israeli army, Goliath shouts of bullying Taunts and tactics basically would find the people of God frozen in fear. It's kind of where we landed. This went on again every day and every night, 39 straight days, 39 straight nights leading up to day 40 until day 40 when David comes on the scene. This is where we're going to pick it up this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 20. Look at it with me if you will. If you do not have a copy of scripture, please know we have um, free Bibles at the resource tables in the front and the back of the room. We would love for you to take one of those home with you as a gift We want everyone to have a physical copy of the word of God. So look at verse 20, chapter 17, 1 Samuel. It starts, it says, So David arose early in the morning and left the flock with a keeper and took the supplies and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting the war cry. So here they go, lining up, right? Battle ready, so to say. Um, And... They, they, again, they've done this for days and days on end, 39 to be exact. Not sure why, again, seems a little bit ridiculously futile, but they're getting themselves all hyped up with their cries and their chants and their cheers and all these things. And as they begin to head out to the battlefield, they're doing all their, their battle yelling and, and all the things. And, and soon they're, they, they're going to face one another yet again, them against the Philistines. And, and um, they draw up in battle array, verse 21 says, army against army. And David decides to leave his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper And he runs to the battle line and he enters in in order that he can greet his brothers that are there. And as he's talking with them, scripture says, here comes Goliath. On schedule, right on cue, coming out of the army of the Philistines, like clockwork, as usual, once again, he begins to speak and spew his poison Say the things that he's been saying now for 39 straight days and 39 straight nights. Here's day 40. And David, this time, the only X factor difference is David is there to actually physically see it and hear it for himself. He's defying God's people. He's making fun of the army of God. He's basically making fun and defying God. And this time, here's David. No matter all the feather ruffling and saber rattling, look at 24, it says, when all the men of Israel saw the man Goliath, once again, they fled from him and they were greatly afraid. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man who keeps coming up? Surely he's coming to defy Israel, to defy the the very God of Israel. And it will be, one of them says this, that the king, Saul, will literally enrich the man who kills this giant with great riches. He's going to give him his daughter, and he's going to make his father's house free in Israel. And David heard that, and he spoke to the guy standing there, and he's saying, wait, hold up, what? What did you just say? What's the king going to do if, if this dude dies? What will be done for the man? Verse 26 says, what's the reward? And then David says this. Wait, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? In other words, David is saying this, right? He's saying, does this big old dude right here know who he's talking to? In other, other words, (laughs) does this dude know who our God is? This is what David's saying. Now, I thought about this for a second. Maybe you are facing a giant right now. And listen, I want, I want you to hear this. Don't be afraid of the giant. Maybe be afraid for the giant. Because obviously, that giant must not know who you are and who your God is. So David is kind of getting a download here. The people answer him in accord with his words saying, thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Saul's going to load up his bank account, make him rich. Going to give him his daughter for marriage, pull him into the fam. And then he's going to basically not charge that man's family taxes 
in perpetuity. No more taxes for his whole family. Sounds like a great deal. All that man has to do is slay that giant. That's it. Now, Eliab, David's older brother, hears David speaking to this man, having this conversation, verse 28 says, and, and he, he begins to get angry at David. And, and he says, David, why are you here? Why have you come down? What are you doing? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness that you're supposed to be taking care of, right? David, don't you have responsibilities elsewhere? What, what do you think you're doing here? We're at battle. You need to go back and do you. What business do you have in this matter? He's basically belittling David. The big boys are busy here. You need to go back to those little few sheep that you're supposed to be playing with and taking care of. Mind your own business, David. You do David, let us do us, right? You just want to see what's going on, David. You just want to get your nose up in the middle. You just want to see battle for yourself, I guess, David. Your arrogance and your pride, David, is going to get the best of you. This is what Eliab is saying to him. Go home. Be with dad. Handle the sheep. But David says this. I mean, isn't this like a little brother? What did I do to you? Look at verse 29. It's right there. What have I done now? It's just a question. I mean, who has a, little, who has a younger sibling? You got to remember those moments. What? It's just a question. That's exactly what David's doing to Eliab right here, right? It's just a question. So not being deterred, verse 30, David turns away from Eliab and goes to another guy. Gets the same answer. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul. Saul sins for him, verse 32. David says, let no man's heart fail on account of him. And so he's speaking to the king now. He says, your servant will go and fight that Philistine. He said, I ain't worried about it. Send me. I'll step up. I got this. He's like, no, don't worry about that giant. Saul basically replies, um, don't be ridiculous, right? Look at 33. Saul says to David, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. You're just a kid. Who are you? You're just a teenager. This guy, I mean, you're a youth. This guy's been a warrior since he was a youth. You're a shepherd. You're a music guy. Look at David's faith, verse 34. You know what? King Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went after him and I attacked him and I rescued it from its mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard. I struck him and I killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. David's saying, I know who I am. I know who I serve. I'm fully prepared and ready. I know that God has a calling on my life. God has an anointing on my life. God has a purpose and a promise for my life. I've done it before. I'll do it now. I got this. And since this giant has defied the armies of the living God, and since he's come and spoken against God, I have no fear. God is by my side and God is with me. Look at verse 37. David says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the bear, that is the God who will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now listen, I think someone really needs to hear this today. Somebody needs to begin to recall and remember the goodness of God, just like we sang about. How many times over and over in our lives has God met us in the moment and ministered to our deepest hurt and need and even taken care of the giant, tore down the wall, broke through the barrier, parted the water so that we could walk through on safe passage. How many times, over and over, the God who has carried you through the deep, the God who has comforted you in the dark, the God who has come to your rescue in the battles, that's the same God who will deliver you today. It's exactly what David's saying. It doesn't matter how big the giant may be. It doesn't matter how fortified the walls may feel. It doesn't matter how massive the mountain may appear. The God who created you and the God who called you, that's the same God who will empower you and that's the same God who will deliver you. It's here that David is about to set up one of the most epic battles between good and evil of all time. And it's very prophetic in nature. It's foreshadowing to another battle to come that's even more epic. It's here that David is about to display and act upon a measure of faith that will have significant and supernatural ramifications for all eternity, literally. I want you to consider the magnitude of this moment. For 40 days now, God's people have operated in absolute fear. And in one hot minute, David chose to operate in authority and faith. He knew who God was, so he fixed his faith on him, just like you heard Daryl talk about in that video. 
David knew if he would do for God what he could do, then God would do for David what he could not do. Here's another thing I believe that David knew. Everybody else was afraid because all they could see was the burden of the battle. But David was emboldened with faith because he saw an opportunity of blessing. David saw an opportunity for for deeper favor with the king. David saw an opportunity for his family. Here's the truth today. Listen, I'm convinced that David was sure of who he was because he was sure of who God was. I'm convinced that David believed that God would deliver him and give him victory. But no matter what, David knew Even if the worst happened, there were some things worth dying for. His family? Absolutely. David saw an opportunity for his family based on what the men had told him what the king would do for the one who defeated the giant. His family was worth fighting for. Can I just speak to the the men in the house today? Your family is worth fighting for. and, And there are giants coming against your family at every turn at all times. I promise, I promise. As my friend, I I had the privilege to hang out with a friend of mine, Dr. Scott Stripling, who was the provost at the Bible seminary this last week. And um, we discussed this text. In fact, he should probably be here preaching it, to be honest, because he's real good. And um, he gave me a lot of great ideas. (laughs) But he said this, he said, he said, once you have something worth dying for, then you'll finally have something worth living for. Yes, David could have easily retreated back to the sheep. Yes, David could have easily gone back to, watch this, the comfort of his regularly scheduled program of life. David could have been like the other men of the army of Israel, frozen in fear of what the giant might or could do. But David refused to sit on the sideline of status quo. David refused the myth of neutrality, as my friend Scott so eloquently expressed. Can I say the church, capital C, church today, a big Goliath that we struggle with is this myth of neutrality? You know, what is that? Well, it's a real problem, I'll tell you that. Because as the church, as the people of God, as the current army of God, so to say, today, seemingly, far too many believers, Christians, would rather be neutral and comfortable than righteous and faithful. It's a myth of neutrality. Think about it. If we know that a spiritual attack is imminent, then our spiritual readiness is an imperative. We should have had that on the screens. <laughs> if we know that a spiritual attack is imminent, then our spiritual readiness is an imperative. This means laziness and comfort are no option. This means disengagement is no option. At least the army of Israel got into formation and shouted battle cries for 40 days. Come on. Might have been posers, but at least they got into formation. They showed up. Today, far too many would rather just stay home and ignore that Goliath even exists. It's not real. It's not happening. All while our culture is, crum- I mean, the culture is crumbling all around us. We're going to hell in a handbasket more and more day in and day out. Our children are being crushed. The family unit is being savagely fractured. Look, David refused apathy and neutrality. David was willing to advance in faith no matter what. The least of these among all. The kid dressed like a shepherd who's supposed to be hanging out with a few sheep is here. Talking big. And David's conviction seemed to convince King Saul. Look at verse 37. David says to Saul, go then and may the Lord be with you. <laughs> right. Good luck. And David goes, oh, hold up. I got an idea. So he, he, Saul begins to clothe David with his garments, right? Let's put my stuff on you. Let's put, here's my bronze helmet. Let me put that on you. Here, here's my armor. Let me put my chain out. Here, put, the, put this on you. He, he, here, take my sword. He gives David his sword. And David begins to try to walk with all this stuff that King Saul owns. And, and, but David's like, I haven't tested these things. This is not me. I don't. And so he says to King Saul, I can't go to battle with these. I'm not testing them. And he begins to take these things off. Listen, I need you to hear me real clear right here. When it comes to spiritual warfare and battles, you got to be who God created you to be. Listen, we're always going to have an attack from the enemy. We have to remember who we are in Christ. We have to remember what we have in Christ. We have to remember who we belong to. We can depend on him. I promise. We don't need anyone else's gift. We don't need anyone else's talent. We don't need anyone else's anointing. We don't need to compare and contrast. Oh, that guy's really going to do it. Look at David in comparison to the army. We don't need anyone else's armor. Listen, we don't need anyone else's and for sure not the world's identity. 
We can trust God and we can trust who we are in him. We can focus our attention on him no matter what, just like Robert and Daryl talked about. Verse 39, David takes off King Saul's stuff and he picks up a stick and shows for himself five smooth stones. Anybody's thinking veggie tails right now? <laughs> and he put them in a bag, right? He put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in the pouch. And, and, and he's got his sling in his hand and he says, this is all I need. Takes off to approach Goliath. Goliath sees David approaching. So Goliath begins to move towards David. He's got his, watch, this is important. He's got his shield bearer in front of him, okay? So David's coming, here comes Goliath. And he's got his shield bearer out in front of him holding his shield, right? David comes so lone and humble as himself. Goliath comes with company, his shield bearer, who is out where? Where is he? In front of him. Kind of away a little bit. Look at verse 42. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. He's a kid. He's ready. Kind of handsome. Philistine says to David, is this a joke? I mean, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And then he begins to curse David and curse David's God. Goliath, spewing his hatred based upon his many gods, He's going through his gods and just using them to curse David, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Remember, 40 days, 40, this is what Goliath has been doing. Ridiculing Israel's God, blaspheming the name of Israel's God. And here's David, a teenage boy at best, no battle armor, just dressed. Oh, watch this. <laughs> here's Goliath with his scaly armor that represents, looks kind of like what they think with his God. Here's David come dressed like his God as a shepherd boy. No weapon of war other than a shepherd's weapon, which could almost be considered a toy in this situation. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> What's she going to do with bing, 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 bing. <laughs> And here's Goliath continuing his mockery and taunting, right? The Philistine says to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Goliath looks at this as one big, hilarious joke, laughing and David, he's seeing the whole thing differently. He's got a totally different perspective. See, David sees this contest. Maybe this is a perspective we need to start thinking. He sees this contest as being one between the true God of Israel and the false gods of the Philistines. David was about to put Goliath, the Philistine army, and everyone else for that matter on notice. You ready for it? He's about to announce that no matter how big your Goliath is, no matter how many soldiers the Philistines may have, no matter the weapons of war they may carry, no matter the mockery and the laughing, no matter the curses, the blasphemy, and the insults, David, believing with total confidence and faith in God, is about to announce that he does not need a sword nor a spear to slay this giant because he has the name of the Lord of God on his side. He has the name of the Lord God. Look at verse 45. David says to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. Listen, you may be in a battle. If you're not, you will be. You've got past experience to know it's a real deal. You may feel belittled right now because you've been taunted by Goliath. You may feel afraid, and I get it, because when attack comes, it can feel scary. But you got to remember, Ephesians 6 instructs us in verse 12, this battle that we're facing is not against flesh and blood. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 instructs us that the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides within you when you are in Christ. The one real true weapon that you need is the one real true weapon that makes all of hell tremble and makes every demon flee. It's the, I, I need y'all to come on with me now. Listen, it's the name at which every knee will bow and it's the name in which every tongue at some point will confess. That is the name of Jesus. That is the number one weapon, and it's the only one that will work. 
Now, as we declare the truth in the word of God to our Goliath, that's what we got to use. Listen, David's not finished. He goes on. Look at verse 46. This day, I mean, he's just, okay, let me just finish. Let me go my last 10%, G-man. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'm going to strike you down, and I'm going to remove your head from your body. And I'm going to give the dead bodies of your whole army this day to the birds of the sky and to the beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. See, here's what David knows and is declaring to Goliath and the whole of the Philistine army. I'm not afraid of you. I, I know who's on my side. He's the one true God. You nor anyone else will ever defy the one true. God will not be mocked. He will deliver you into my hands. And here's what's about to go down, Goliath. I'm about to cut off your head. Then I'm about to slaughter your army. And then I'm going to feed your dead carcasses to the animals. And this victory will declare God's name and power to every living being on this entire planet. I know who God is. I know who I am. I come in the name of the Lord. And this battle is the Lord's. And here is the rest of the story. You ready? David sees this moment of opportunity. He perceives a window, if you will. Remember, Goliath is there and his shield bearer is... This dumb giant thinks his tactics are going to work against the power in the name of the one true God. And not only that, he has no real shield of cover because his shield bearer is. See, we got to learn to perceive the windows in the war. Don't wait for it to come to you. The enemy's going to put his little minions in front of him all the time. We gotta, see, we gotta see the moment. We gotta keep in mind when it comes to spiritual warfare, the devil always overreaches, but he can never overreach or outreach God. We can always know who we are in Christ. We can always know what we possess in Christ. There is power in the name of Jesus because there is power in the blood of Jesus. We just sang about it. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcome him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. You know what? There's some things maybe worth dying for, but I'm not dying here today. Goliath is. Because I come in the name of the Lord my God and my testimony is the greatness of the one true God and the blood of the lamb. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word. The enemy has no cover when it comes to the blood of the lamb and the name of Jesus. There is nothing he can do against the name of Jesus. Finish it. If God is for us, who is, who can be? Listen, we have to perceive the window. We got to learn to see the moment for what it is. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember what you're called to be. Remember what you have upon in the name of Jesus and call upon the name of Jesus. Declare his word. Declare his truth in the moment of battle. De begin to declare the testimony of how God has been faithful and powerful in battles past. Plead the blood of Jesus every time. Fasting first, by the way. Remember how God has worked. Declare it. Testify to the giant. Speak to that wall. Declare to that mountain. Our God is the one true God. He's faithful and our God is our victor. We've overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We got to learn to see the moment, but also number two, we got to be willing to step in faith. We got to seize, as, as, as my friend Scott says, seize the initiative. Step in faith. We got to step in faith. Look at verse 48 as we close. Then it happened. When the Philistines rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. See, David didn't wait on Goliath to attack. David went on the offense. He took the initiative. He anticipated the battle. He got in front of it. Verse 49, David put his hand in his bag, took from it the stone, slung it at the, struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevails over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him and there was no sword in David's hand. But look at verse 51, just as David said he would. He takes, he runs and, and stands over the Philistine. I'm sure is a moment of, told you. Takes a sword, draws it, and not to be gross, but literally kills the Philistine, cuts off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Verse 52, the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley. All of a sudden, they got some boldness in them. You know why? Because when one child of God understands who they are in God, 
begins to take initiative in the name of God, step in faith in a moment, you're going to see the faith of others begin to rise up around you. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistine and plundered their camps. And David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem, put his weapons in the tent. Story goes on. He keeps, he goes into the king and the king says, whose son is this? And David's still clutching this giant's head. See, as we said last week, there's going to be giants in the path to your purpose. As a child of God, there's always going to be a battle. You're always going to face a giant because when God anoints kings, the devil assigns giants. You may, again, you may be facing a giant in your life right now. And maybe your step one is just to begin to believe and declare. Don't, you don't have to be afraid. Because of the blood of the lamb, you have a testimony that your God is victorious. And this battle is the Lord's. Begin to see it for what it is. Begin to realize, I know who I am. I know who I serve. I know God has a calling and anointing on my life. He's got a purpose and a promise for me. And there's some things, listen, even if this giant takes me out, there's some things worth dying for. To live as Christ, to die as gain. But I will not be afraid of this giant because he will not have the ultimate victory over my life. That's already been sealed. And since this giant continues to defy the children of the living God, since he's come against and spoken against me and us and God, I have no fear. God's on my side. God will be with me. Now, this is cool. Earlier in the message, I said that David, he's about to display and act upon a measure of faith that will have significant and supernatural ramifications for all eternity. Literally, I said it was prophetic. Let me show you why I said this. If you will, go, to the, go with me to the very first verse in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and I want you to see what it says. Understand, remember, that Jesus would come through the root of Jesse, that, that when Saul disobeyed, God found another king in David. And Dave, look what Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says. Put that on the screen, movie. It says this. This is the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. The son of who? See, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, the Lord is salvation. That's what that means. The Christos, Messiah, the anointed one. This, this it goes on and it says this. The son of David. Think about it. What if Goliath had killed David that day? What ramifications would that have had? I don't know if David, look, they, they had passed down the stories from old. I don't know if David understood fully if he, oh, I am that David. I don't know. So David, he wasn't just fighting because he was bored and had nothing better to do. He wasn't just fighting because he wanted some money and no taxes and a new bride. He wasn't just fighting because no one else would and everyone else was scared to. Listen, David was fighting because the giant had to be slain. David was fighting because the giant was standing in the way of God's people and was defying them and God. David was fighting on behalf of God's people for all time. David was fighting for you and for me as well. Again, think about it. All of salvation was on the line in this battle. And it's a picture it was an epic battle between David and Goliath, actually representing a battle between good and evil. Prophetic in nature, foreshadowing. Because the greatest battle of all between Jesus and the devil would happen. And this, the, listen, the giant would have to be slain. The head of the serpent would have to be crushed and cut off. And David is showing us a picture here. This is the story of Jesus, the son of David. Hmm. Huh. You see it? What battle are you fighting? What Goliath are you facing? We're going to sing. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing. Speak the name of Jesus. Maybe you need to start here. Speak the name. Declare the name of Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus. Every giant must bow to the name of Jesus. Every giant. Come on, let's go ahead and start singing this morning. I'm just going to invite you. Listen, could, could, could it be that there's a far greater reason for the battle you're facing? Speak the name of Jesus. Could it be there's a far bigger reason for the battle you're facing? Oh, 
over every heart could it be that God may use this battle you are in for his redemptive person in other things there is peace within you see the moment step in faith speak the name of Jesus amen if you're here today and you need to surrender your life to Jesus right now would you just call upon his name I just want to speak Jesus I need you and I surrender to you today You've never invited him into your life. Maybe you do it right now. Jesus, I invite you to take full control of my life. I surrender and yield to you. Would you fill me with your spirit right now in this moment and change my life forever? Your name is power. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Your name we have prayer partners on the wall over to your right and the altar is open if you just need some ministry time and prayer please take that if you just invited Christ into your life would you please right now move to where they're moving and just let them pray with you and encourage you they just want to invite you and, and encourage you to take that next step And if you're not ready to do that today would you text the name Jesus to 43,000 but let's just respond for this time and and declare, come on. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. Oh, I speak Jesus.
family, it's so good to see you this morning. Y'all have a seat for just a second. I'll tell you a couple things. Hey, listen, if you've been getting the uh, Slaying Giants 21 days uh, in your email, uh, raise your hand. It's been so good, right? Su such great. Listen, it's not too late to uh, sign up and be a part of that. If you need more information, I want to invite you to, to uh, uh, visit the Connection Center on your way out. Uh, someone is there waiting, and they can tell you how to do that. Um, listen, you heard Pastor John talk about DNA. DNA is such an important part of Declaration. It's where you get to learn more about who we are. I want to invite you to be a part of that. Starts this coming Wednesday, the 21st, uh, at the Declaration Warehouse. DNA is where we will learn uh, about uh, the church here, and you have an opportunity to hear directly from Pastor John and Kelly. So right after service, same thing. Go visit the Connection Center, learn more about DNA, get signed up, learn more about the heartbeat of Declaration. And uh, man, groups are coming up. Who's excited about groups at Declaration? Woo, amen. Listen, take your next step uh, this fall by joining, joining a group or leading a group. Uh, and man, maybe, maybe you've been uh, feeling a nudge from the Lord to, that it's time to lead a group. I wanna invite you to, to do that. Take your next step uh, in your faith walk, your faith journey with, with the Lord and lead a group. Uh, Pastor Aaron is where? Pastor Aaron, stand up, Pastor Aaron. It's a beautiful campus pastor, Pastor Aaron. Thank you, sir. All right, isn't he handsome, everybody? Listen, Pastor Aaron is gonna be available right after service. You wanna learn more about leading a group, uh, he wants to tell you all about it. So find him near the Connection Center. He wants to tell you about uh, leading a group. Uh, take your next step in that journey. Hey, listen, um, some really cool things are happening right now as we speak. Um, man, we get to partner with the Lord through our generosity. And right now as we speak in Mexico and in Turkey, uh, we have partnered with pastors who are leading people to the saving name of Jesus for the very first time. Can we celebrate that? It's good stuff. Incredible things are happening. Because of our generosity, we've, we've been able to do that. Um, listen, um, also because of our generosity, we've helped families all over the world see Jesus for the first time. We've provided school supplies to children all over Montgomery County. Um, we have uh, partnered and supported teachers and administrators right here in Conroe ISD to, to, to take on this uh, next school year, knowing that Declaration has our backs. And that's because we have partnered, you guys have partnered with, with uh, what the Lord is doing with your generosity. Uh, and because of your generosity, we will soon step foot on our permanent ministry facility, the Declaration New Campus that's coming, guys. Can we celebrate that? Amen in Jesus' name. So I wanna invite, invite you to partner with what God's doing with, and, and, and doing that through your generosity. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. Visit the Declaration website, visit, visit the Connection Center and learn more about how you can be a part uh, of, uh, of partnering with the Lord and uh, stepping into your generosity journey. Uh, visit the Declaration website for everything that you've heard today. There's so many things that God wants you to be a part of and to step into. So many exciting things. Hey, thank you so much for checking us out online today. If you need to make a decision about the next steps in your faith journey with Jesus, text CONNECT to 43000. And if you took the first step in your faith journey today by saying yes to Jesus, we wanna know about it and we wanna walk with you. So text JESUS to 43000. There you will find some resources and a message from Pastor John. There are so many ways to connect to Declaration. Check out declaration.org to find out more about who we are. Before we go, let's say our declaration together. Because of what the gospel has done in and to us, our lives exist to help people encounter and follow Jesus. We will devote ourselves to his word, his presence, and his people. We desire authenticity, intimacy, a heart of service, and to see his kingdom come. We are for Jesus and for people. Hey, have a great week. We're so glad you joined us. Bye for now.